Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second to last lecture of the second wave of the pandemic science and society. Our last lecture will be in one week. Um, that will mark the end of what is easily the most complicated year of higher education that at least I have experienced during my career. So I think you all should feel quite good about making it to the end here. Um, today, we will have the third lecture in our series on the Anthropocene and the pandemic or human impacts on nature and pandemics. Annika Nilsson and I will both be speaking today. As you may recall from our lecture on misinformation and disinformation and patient-led research, Annika is a graduate student in the Department of Anthropology focusing on sociocultural anthropology. Annika will speak first, then I'll present some additional information, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Welcome again, Annika. Hi, good to be back. Let me share my screen. Okay, does that look right? Okay. <laughs> um, cool. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more about um, the concept of the Anthropocene, uh, where it came from, who uses it, and also some critiques of it. Um, so contemporary use um, of the term Anthropocene comes from the geological sciences, uh, most particularly stratigraphy. Uh, stratigraphy is the science that looks at layers of the earth, um, where you get this kind of thing from. Um, we can look at the composition of different layers of the earth and learn things about kind of what kind of plants and animals there were and what the climate of the earth was like um, and major geological events like uh, volcanic eruptions and things like that. Um, a brief timeline of the contemporary use of the term Anthropocene. Um, just to note, 1999 um, was not actually the first appearance of the idea that humans are having a massive and lasting impact on the earth. The earliest recorded use of this idea um, is around 1873 when an, an Italian geologist uh, made reference to what he called an Anthropozoic era. Um, and there was informal use of the term Anthropocene in the 70s and 80s, but in 1999, atmospheric chemist Paul Critzen um, formally proposed the concept of the Anthropocene at a conference on the Holocene, which was the last geological age. Um, in 2000, Critzen collaborated with physicist Eugene Stromer to publish a paper arguing for the Anthropocene um, to be formally recognized as a new geological epoch. In 2009, the Anthropocene Working Group of the Subcommittee on Quaternary Stratigraphy is convened, um, and they have been working on this concept since then. Uh, the Anthropocene Working Group voted on a specific boundary delineating the Anthropocene from the Holocene in 2016 and presented those recommendations to the International Geological Congress. And this year, um, they will vote on whether or not to formally adopt the Anthropocene as the next geological era. Um, so I'm going to read briefly um, a little excerpt from the Anthropocene Working Group's report on the Anthropocene. Phenomena associated with the Anthropocene include an order of magnitude increase in erosion and sediment transport associated with urbanization and agriculture, marked and abrupt anthropogenic perturbations of the cycles of elements such as carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and various metals, together with new chemical compounds, environmental changes generated by these perturbations, including global warming, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and spreading oceanic dead zones, rapid changes in the biosphere on both land and sea as a result of habitat loss, predation, explosion of domestic animal populations and species invasions, and the proliferation and global dispersion of many new minerals and rocks, including concrete, fly ash, and plastics, and the myriad technofossils produced from these and other materials. Many of these changes will persist for millennia or longer and are altering the trajectory of the earth system, some with permanent effect. Um, I think it is really staggering to kind of hear all of that listed together at once um, and also to see it alongside these images, um, which are from this book called Anthropocene, um, put together by the Canadian photographer Edward Bertinsky. Um, many of them are kind of big aerial images of geological um, and ecological change like that. Um, and the book kind of gives some more details about what they are and what they come where they come from. And there's also a, a film, um, which is I think a really great thing to check out if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, 
obviously this is really bad, um, but I'm not going to belabor the point because I think you all already know that um, and probably spend a lot of time being anxious about it. I know I do. Um, and the problems of the Anthropocene are practical, obviously, but they're also conceptual and perceptual. Um, we've talked about some of the perceptual challenges associated with understanding a pandemic like COVID-19. Um, like it's difficult for us to perceive exponential growth. Um, it's difficult for us to make sense of things that we can't directly perceive in front of us. Um, and I think the, the Anthropocene really blows up all of these problems on a scale that we've never quite had to contend with before um, in terms of how we think about space and also how we think about time. Um, so when we look at many of the, the ecological changes associated with the Anthropocene um, and the pollution that is causing a lot of them, um, we move from thinking about kind of micro particles that are polluting the atmosphere to global climate patterns very quickly. Um, in terms of time, we're now thinking about both the very deep future and the very deep past in ways that we haven't before. Um, like oil and petroleum, for example, takes us from dinosaurs through to thousands of years in the future um, when the effects of fossil fuel use on the earth system will still be present. Um, so we have limited cognitive and epistemic tools um, for dealing with problems like this, and we're getting to the point where we need to make some better ones really quickly. Um, so I'm going to start off by um, revisiting Professor Richard Smith's talk on human ecology from a few weeks ago in the semester. Um, Professor Smith is a wonderful scholar and I have learned a lot by working with him, but I'm also going to very strenuously disagree with the way that he framed that problem. Um, you might remember that Professor Smith uh, described human impacts on the environment and resource use um, using the metaphor of the tragedy of the commons, which looks something like this. Um, the tragedy of the commons story comes from a pre-industrial England um, when small peasant farmers shared a property on which they grazed their livestock and no one owned it. Um, and they just kind of all made use of it collectively. Uh, and the, the story goes that because everybody was grazing their livestock in places and times that were personally best for them, um, the environment ended up becoming degraded, like this illustration shows. Um, when we talk about the commons, we tend to be talking about resources that um, are not privately owned, that everyone has more or less equal access to, um, and all of the human actors in the tragedy of the commons story are acting in more or less the same ways. This ain't it. There are specific human activities that are causing the problems associated with the Anthropocene, um, but it is not a commons problem. We don't treat the environment around us as a commons. There are people who are making decisions. Um, not everybody is making equal decisions. Not everybody has equal capacity to make decisions. Um, and most of the time in cases of you know, environmental exploitation, um, the pieces of the environment that are being exploited are privately owned um, and decisions about how to use them are being made by private actors. The word Anthropocene comes from the Greek roots Anthropos and Kainos, which mean human and new or recent, um, age of humans or age of man as it's often called. Um, but it makes us wonder or question, are we actually talking about all people? Um, is this an inherently human problem? Let's get more specific. So what kinds of activities, just brainstorm for yourself or drop it in the chat if you want to, are causing the kinds of ecological changes associated with the Anthropocene? Would you like me to read some of these? Um, I think I can see them. Yeah, here we go. So we've got cars, um, pollution, deforestation, industrial production, um, lots of land use, fracking, um, lots of different kinds of extractive industries, lots of cars coming up again. Yeah, this is great. So this is more or less what I came up with too. Um, extractive industries, industrial agriculture, mass manufacturing, uh, global shipping and travel infrastructures and reliance on digital tech, which consumes a ton of energy. And how we engage with these things is often not something that we have a whole lot of control over. Cars are a really great example here. Um, having a society where everyone has to own a car in order to get around consumes a ton of en energy and a ton of fossil fuels, generates a ton of waste because cars don't last forever. Um, but then again, you don't always have the option not to have a car if you need to get 
to your job, you need to get to school, you need to go buy groceries. Um, lots and lots of places in the US especially don't have um, kind of mass public infrastructure that can support people not having cars. Um, you know, we've built an entire system of highways that crisscrosses this country that even if we were to all stop using cars tomorrow, the kind of physical way we've organized our society where things are in proximity to each other was built with the assumption that people would have cars. So it's not something that's always easy to kind of opt out of like this. Um, I know um, digital tech is another example. So earlier in the semester, we were talking a little bit about um, the rare earth minerals that go into um, producing our smartphones and laptops and stuff. There is no such thing as like fair trade Colton. It just doesn't exist. Um, and if you are trying to be like a more or less functional person in US white collar society, it's very hard to do that without um, some piece of digital technology to your name. Um, my point here is that agency is not evenly distributed. The field of choices that is available to people is limited um, and we can't reverse engineer this system through consumer choice. Um, and we don't treat the earth or the environment as a commons. We mostly treat it as private property. Um, so all choices are not weighted equally and they're not unconstrained. And thinking and acting as though every person's individual choices are just as significant as these global systems of extraction and production that are designed to use and to waste astonishing quantities of resources leads very quickly to thinking about things like population control. And individual choice-based solutions can start to look authoritarian very quickly. Enter eco-fascism. Um, I think we've seen more of um, in some eco-activist grassroots movements recently. Um, eco-fascist ideas aren't really easy to categorize according to our conventional kind of right and left um, ways of dividing up political ideas. Um, but they are, they take some of these ideas that, you know, humans are inherently, um, you know, wasteful, extractive creatures. Humans are a cancer to the earth is the kind of dramatic way of putting that, but I'm sure you've heard ideas like that before, overpopulation and resource scarcity, um, and proceeds from that um, into thinking that the only way to kind of solve climate crises um, is to start exercising a really high degree of authoritarian control over individual choices. And very often um, this kind of control comes down on people in the global south. Um, if you're gonna run with an idea like overpopulation and you look at global birth rates, um, you will see that people in the global south tend to have more children on average than those in industrial western countries, um, even though the smaller number of children that are born in industrial and western countries use far and away more resources over the course of our lifetimes. Um, and the use of the tragedy of the commons is really clever here uh, because the actual situation it describes predates the industrial revolution. Um, so it kind of it erases the whole history of how this system of production came to be and makes it into a problem of human nature. And what solution could that problem possibly have other than fascism? Um, in reality, this is a new historically and culturally specific mode of production, um, not to romanticize the past or like romanticize the other um, societies all over have struggled with resource management throughout human history, um, but never on this scale um, and never with this far reaching impact. Um, and the geophysical vocabularies of geology and of stratigraphy are just not equipped to capture um, these kinds of cultural specificities. And so they lump them in under this broad, vague umbrella term of anthropos or the human. Um, and the elision of the historical and cultural and political specificity of the system of production that got us here actually plays directly into what social theorist Mark Fisher calls capitalist realism, uh, which is the pervasive inability to imagine other ways of doing things or other ways of organizing social life and production. Um, Fisher describes capitalist realism as having solidified after the fall of the Soviet Union um, when certain political actors in Western Europe and the US kind of seized onto that um, as proof that socialism has failed um, and capitalism is the right and the best way. And it very powerfully yokes capitalist ideas about human nature and the naturalness of private property and market exchange um, and hierarchy. So if you take a look at this quote, you know, what counts as realistic, what seems possible at any point in the social field is defined by a series of political determinations. An ideological position can never be really successful until it is naturalized and it cannot be naturalized while it is still thought of as value rather than as fact. This to me echoes a lot of the language that you hear politicians use um, when they're trying to explain to whiny constituents uh, why it's just not realistic um, or why it's not possible to take stronger measures um, against climate change now. 
who when we describe the present state of affairs as a problem of the human um, with a broad ahistorical non-specific term like the Anthropocene, we limit our ability to talk and act with rigor and specificity um, that are necessary to begin to address this omni-crisis. Um, and also when we situate the, the looming ecological apocalypse in either the present or the very near future um, as the singular conclusion of a single trajectory of acceleration, um, it conveniently glosses over all of the worlds that have already ended as a result of this system of production. Um, I don't know if you can tell from looking at this, but this, this is a pile of buffalo skulls um, from the mid 19th century in the American West. Um, buffalo were very nearly wiped out um, in pre-industrial settlement of the US West, um, along with about 90% of the indigenous population of the continent. Um, so there are some people who are already living after the end of the world or maybe we should say whose worlds have already ended. Um, so this thing called the Anthropocene should prompt us to really reckon with the concept of the human. So let's do that for a minute. Um, what does the human mean? But Annika, you might say, you can look that up in a dictionary. We know what the human means. The human is, is Homo sapiens. It is the species that we are. Um, primates, mammals, and so on and so forth. I don't think that's actually particularly helpful in this case. And it proceeds from a way of thinking about language that approaches it as a closed system with a logical structure where questions about meaning can be solved by looking at the rules that govern the structure and meaning itself is fixed. Um, this is actually very hard to do because it turns out the rules of language change all the time and the correspondence of relationship and representation between things and words is very slippery. Um, I'm drawing here from Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, who's a philosopher of math and language, um, who offers an alternative that kind of flips the script and says that meaning of language doesn't come from its structure or its rules, it comes from its use. Um, and it's not really possible to systematize or ruleify language. And if you really wanna know about meaning as something that affects the world um, instead of as an abstract principle, uh, then you should look at how words are actually being used and the work that they're doing to organize the world and make it comprehensible. So another way of asking this in this context might be, what work is the concept of the human doing in conversations about the Anthropocene? Uh, where and how is it being used and by whom and to what ends? The idea of the human long predates the biological concept of Homo sapiens um, or the concept of species or biology as a discipline. And older definitions don't magically get overwritten when new ones arrive. Um, they get kind of dragged along and folded into the present. Nowadays, the work, the concept of the human does a lot of work to make similar um, and to kind of erase cultural differences. Um, but it has also in the past worked to differentiate. Separating the human from the non-human creates different worlds and different ethical orders, um, different ways of relating with other creatures who we've categorized in different ways. Uh, geology, uh, the science of the earth, which now claims the authority to define and describe and identify um, causes of changes in world systems, participates in this work of the making of the human, as it participates in the work of making what is not human. The logic of geology uh, populates the world with kinds of things. It defines and describes matter in terms of properties, which performs two functions. One of those is to construct a logic of being or a logic of essence that defines things in possessive terms. Um, and the other is to enact a division between the living and the non-living, um, between timeless substrate and people in history, between extractable inert resources and the agents who put them to use. The exercise of classification is inseparable from the process of extraction and evaluation. Um, in other words, geology names and classifies in order to organize and govern extraction and use. The development of geology as a discipline happened alongside and in collaboration with two other big events, the beginning of a global regime of extractive colonialism and the development of the Western industrial economy. So keep in mind that at the beginning of this process, we don't have homo sapiens yet. Uh, instead, um, and if you're an anthro major and you've learned a little bit about the history of the discipline of anthropology, you might know some of this already. Um, we have a hierarchical understanding of human development that places white European civilization at the top of a developmental ladder. Um, European colonial powers understood themselves as uh, the peak of advancement or development of civilization. And their way of being was what all other cultures and peoples uh, might one day achieve. And that's the nice version of that idea. Like there's another version of that idea that says that, you know, people who are not white Europeans will never achieve that level of civilization and are in fact a different order of being are not, could never be fully human. 
So geology emerges as a process of making sense of the extractive potentials of colonialism and of carving up the world as chunks of matter and blocks of resources owned by competing colonial powers. And this unsurprisingly is a racialized and racializing process. And by this, I mean that it begins with a hierarchy in mind and categorizes things in large part by slotting them into that hierarchy. And it produces race through the same kind of classificatory looping effect that I discussed in my last lecture. Um, so Black African and North and South American indigenous people here, remember, were not really human according to European colonizers. Um, instead, they were treated as a resource. Uh, you can see in primary source historical documents the ways in which colonizers and early industrialists talked about gold, salt, iron, marble, copper, cotton, sugar, and slaves in the same register. Uh, the Western coast of Africa, which is a major locus of both slave trade and gold mining was often referred to as the mine. The context of agricultural and early industrial development in the Americas, we know that slaves weren't legally considered human or morally or scientifically. They were treated as a resource from which to extract energy in the form of labor. Geology and the emerging human sciences collaborated in order to exclude some people from the category of the human in order to make this system of extraction and production work. Black feminist writer and theorist Sylvia Winter says, slavery transformed the human subject of his own culture into the inhuman object of European culture. Um, and so these next few images are taken from contemporary textbooks and education resources to just demonstrate how we still do this. Um, in all of these images, you can see um, natural and agricultural resources like sugar, tobacco, rum, ivory, gold, um, alongside slaves. And notably, you don't see um, any other form of human migration represented in these photos. Um, so we're not categorizing, you know, white European immigrants from Europe um, to North America in these depictions of trade, um, but we are including slaves and lumping them in kind of alongside natural resources, which I think is very revealing. Here's another one. This keeps getting worse. And again, these are new. These are like in textbooks now. Um, no. Being human is a praxis, Sylvia Winter. In other words, the human can't be taken for granted as a natural or self-evident category. Um, it's something we are actively making in the way that we relate to each other all the time. The boundaries of the human and what makes someone human are constantly being produced through lived relations. And human as a praxis intersects with geological class classificatory practices to inform category designations of what is inhuman. But all of this and the entire question of who made the conditions of the present and how and against whom or on top of whom or through the violent extraction to the point of destruction of which kinds of bodies is erased when we call it the Anthropocene. Um, also, I'm drawing a lot of the past 10 slides or so from this book, uh, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None by Catherine Yusoff, um, which is um, a short kind of history of geology and how it has produced both race and humanness. So. This um, is taken from a blog post by Paul Kurtzen, who's one of the original um, scientists to use the term Anthropocene. Um, I thought it was just like really stunningly revealing of some of the ideology that's going on underneath this. So he says, to master this huge shift, we must change the way we perceive ourselves and our role in the world. Teaching students that we are living in the Anthropocene, the age of men could be of great help. Rather than representing yet another sign of human hubris, this name change would stress the enormity of humanity's responsibility as stewards as of the earth. With the countries of the world striving to attain the American way of life, citizens of the West should redefine it and pioneer a modest, renewable, mindful, and less material lifestyle. We also need to develop geoengineering capabilities in order to prepare for worst case scenarios. So let's unpack this a little bit. We're constructing a we here. So, you know, Kretzen and Schwager are trying to construct an in-group and speak to their peers, who are men, who are human, who are citizens of the West. So we see a not particularly subtle equivalence being drawn between we, men, human, and citizens of the West in contrast to countries of the world. Some people, are more man-human citizen than others. 
It also pictures uh, countries of the world or everyone else, everyone who is not included under the we men human citizens of the West as striving to attain the American way of life um, in a way that kind of subtly places some amount of blame on them. Um, at, while at the same time, it positions we men human citizens of the West as the pioneers who are going to fix the problem that is caused by that striving. Um, I'm quoting from Catherine Yusuf again, this attempt to absolve the positionality of Western colonial knowledge and extraction practices while simultaneously reinforcing and resettling them in new territory, a Western frontier of pioneers armed with eco-optimism and geoengineering indicates the desire to overcome coloniality without a corresponding relinquishment of the power it continues to generate in terms of who gets to formulate, implement, and speak to the future. The colonial assumption for responsibility for and of the world is articulated anew as the white man's burden, a paternalism that is tied to a redemptive narrative of saving the world from harm on account of others while maintaining a protective thick skin of innocence. So if all of this is contained within the idea of the Anthropocene, what alternative geologics might enable us to think and act differently? And people are proposing some ideas. Um, the Capitalocene um, is an idea that has been proposed by Jason Moore. It emphasizes the centrality of capitalism, private property, and imperatives to profit and growth that drive the global system of extraction and production. Um, the Plantationocene is another proposal that acknowledges and emphasizes the origin of the present system of global production in plantation economies driven by slave labor, um, without which the material wealth that launched the industrial economy would not have been possible. Um, and finally, the Cthulhu scene proposed by um, Donna Haraway is not really an alternative name for the Anthropocene, so much as an alternative mode of life that might be possible, um, that asks how we might forge different kinds of relations and make kin um, by placing ourselves in ethical and ontological relation with others within and across boundaries as we know them. Um, even more so than that, though, especially for people living in Western industrialized countries and working in the Western episteme or the Western tradition of philosophy and science, it might be a good time to do less talking and more listening um, to knowledge that has been and continues to be produced um, by marginalized peoples who've been most profoundly impacted by this system. So here we have um, black feminist philosophies of the human um, exemplified by Alexander Wahelia's habeas viscous um, and of course, Sylvia Winter. Um, and also North American indigenous histories of activism who have, in a sense, already lived through a major ecological apocalypse. Um, there are two ways to read this, um, and I think we need to practice doing both at once. On the one hand, we're already knee deep in the worst case scenario. We're facing a crisis of planetary proportion and addressing it is going to require very hard work. It's the work of unlearning and of undoing, not only a system of production, but a whole way of life and a whole metaphysics that underpins it. And there is no way to do this without sacrificing both material things and ideas that we have about ourselves and our place in the world. Um, and there's no way to do this without suffering and probably a lot of death. Um, but at the same time, nothing about this was natural or inevitable. What sometimes gets called human nature, um, but might better be described as human life ways or human practices of world making are extraordinarily plastic. There are unimaginable otherwises yet to be realized. And we have the capacity to imagine and enact different worlds, not as individuals and not overnight, and like maybe not even within our lifetimes, but it does not have to be this way. Thank you very much. I think that's a, a great point. It does not have to be this way. Um, and so I wanna pick up from there and then we'll go to questions and, and talk a little bit more about that and how we understand these, these issues and are framing them. Um, and so, uh, okay. So, you know, I think that one thing we need to acknowledge is um, the real cost of, of these human activities. And I think that gets at some of these ideas that, you know, the, the opportunities are not equally distributed. The activities are not equally distributed. Um, and yet I think that we, people so often think of destruction of the environment as a necessary cost or a necessary evil to doing business or you know progress in general. Um, and I think all of what Annika just talked about kind of uh, challenges those ideas. Um, but I would say also to add to that, that in fact, uh, corporations and industries are benefiting from not being charged the actual price of 
destroying nature at the rates that they are. And in, in fact, more generally, people, um, including a lot of people who are often left out of these conversations, are the ones who are paying the price and, and we will continue, um, people in general will continue to pay the price for this. So I wanna just give you some information about the costs of us destroying nature that are never factored into business models um, or, or charged to those who are working in these industries. And that I think need to, we need a reframing in which we start to incorporate some of this information. So I'll just give you some examples. Human-induced climate change leads to costs associated with infrastructure and crisis response, right? So these are things like dealing with the fact that sea levels are rising. Also dealing with extreme weather events. Um, we know that with each extreme weather event, Hurricane Katrina, for example, there was a monetary cost to that as a result of our changing weather patterns, which are related to climate change. Also wildfires, we're seeing, I mean, if anyone can remember before the pandemic, the big news before the pandemic was um, these, these wildfires that were happening in multiple locations. Obviously this is horrible for the environment, it's horrible for wildlife, it's horrible for the people living there, but there is also a price that you can calculate that all of these things cost, right? They cost money and so this, the way we have set this up in which, um, you know, the, the business doesn't actually incorporate these different costs is really problematic. We also know that environmental toxins are being released into the environment through agricultural chemicals, plastics, fracking, and much more. These environmental toxins lead to costs associated with health healthcare for resulting health problems. Um, including, of course, big ones are cancer and infertility that are associated with environmental toxins. And so when you actually factor in those costs, that changes the business model, right? But currently, those things are not being factored in or not being charged to the companies that are doing business that cause these environmental toxins to be released into the environment. Um, there's also costs of infrastructure, for example, to clean up water, land and air, not that the, we even necessarily have the technology to effectively clean up these things, uh, but you know, it, it falls on other individuals to pay those costs um, because we don't include them in how we're calculating the cost of destruction of the, the natural environment for businesses. Monoculture farming is a huge problem. It's leading to the loss of bees, and you've probably heard about this. If you haven't, then, um, you know, unfortunately, I think we are doing kind of a bad job of, of spreading this information. But in fact, losing bees is a is a huge loss to our economy. So this is an old statement from 2014 um, from the Obama White House. It's a fact sheet about the economic challenge posed by declining pollinator populations. And I'm just going to show you parts of this. It says, Honeybees enable the production of at least 90 commercially grown crops in North America. Honeybees account for more than $15 billion through their vital role in keeping fruits, nuts, and vegetables in our diet. And native wild pollinators, such as bumblebees and alfalfa leafcutter bees, also contribute substantially to the domestic e economy. In 2009, the crop benefits from native insect pollination in the United States were valued at more than nine billion dollars. These are things that we can calculate and put a price on. We know that they are valuable and yet there is no tax or cost associated with monoculture farming that we know leads to a decline in bees, right? So there's lots of evidence now that having these massive fields all of one particular type of crop um, is, is not good for native pollinators um, and other insects and so it results in this loss of bees, um, as do the chemicals that we're using in these large farming situations. We actually have an estimate for the annual worth of nature's services, um, and that's $125 trillion globally. So the World Wildlife Fund 
had this 2018 report, the Living Planet Report, in which they estimated some of the benefits that we get from nature, including estimating the, the monetary benefits that we get from nature. Now, again, keep in mind that within our system, you know, we aren't charging the corporations or the industries that are taking away from these natural services. And so this cost just falls on, you fill in the blank. Um, so how will we fund $125 trillion worth of free services after we've destroyed the nature that normally provides them? I think that we need to reframe how we approach this issue to acknowledge that there are uh, costs with the way we are treating the planet. And in fact, it isn't just a matter of thinking, well, this is just a necessary evil for, for how we make progress. We are actually not making progress. And you know, there's, there's going to be a point in which there's going to be a tipping point in which we start to very strongly feel the effects of all of this. Obviously, for people living along coastlines, for example, or in wildfire areas, a lot of people are already feeling um, the costs of this. So here are some images from that um, Living Planet report, uh, including that nature is providing things like food, shelter, and medicine, also clean water, air, and healthy soil. You know, there's a, there's a natural um, cleaning process that happens in, in nature, uh, pulling out pollutants from air and soil. We obviously also have biodiversity in nature. And there's also um, more recognition of the fact that nature inspires a lot of people. So there's some intangible value to nature as well. Um, they created this chart, which is kind of laying out the various ways in which we gain benefits from nature. So again, things like food, raw materials, uh, medicine, fresh water, positive air or a good air quality, climate regulation. Um, but then over here also things like access to recreation and ecotourism, um, mental and physical health benefits, and spiritual and religious value not to mention things like photosynthesis, soil formation, pollination, and so on. So there's a lot that we can get from nature, and yet we don't factor in the cost of destroying it when we're figuring out these business models. Not only are we losing costs by needing to, to pay more for infrastructure, needing to pay more for crisis response in terms of natural disasters, in terms of losing free ecosystem services, but we now know with COVID-19 that the cost of destroying nature and coming into closer contact with animals also results in a very significant cost to our society of paying for pandemics. So this is an article um, called the COVID-19 pandemic and the $16 trillion virus, which estimates the, the sorts of monetary costs that this pandemic has introduced. Now, there's obviously a million different ways that this sort of estimate could go. And in particular, in this article, they were focused on unemployment, loss of life, health complications, and mental health, right? So we know that there's a bunch of other ways that you could lose money. Um, but in particular, they kind of highlighted how expensive this pandemic is just from these particular areas. And I'll be honest, it includes some grim calculations. Like for example, the economic cost of premature death expected through the next year is $4.4 trillion. For COVID-19 survivors, the estimated loss from long-term compl complications, because we know that COVID is associated with long-term complications in some survivors, um, is estimated 2.6 trillion for cases forecast through the next year. So all of these are just within 2021, this is the estimation. And because of the mental health toll of losing loved ones, losing economic security, feeling isolated, um, the mental health symptoms, if they only last for one year, this article estimated that the, these losses could reach approximately $1.6 trillion. Um, and so overall, this is a table from this, uh, from this paper, and you can see that these health losses make up a large chunk of the cost of this pandemic. And actually the total cost that they're estimating is 90% of our annual GDP. 
So we know that, that there is a cost that can be estimated of the way that we are interacting with nature. And yet we have not yet changed our policies, changed our mindset for how we're approaching these things in order to try and actually um, get at these issues. And similar to what Anika was saying and also things that I've said in other lectures, instead we actually put a lot of the onus on people in the global south who are um, living in areas of high biodiversity or living in close proximity to wildlife, which is incredibly problematic because as I hope by now I have made clear, the issues that we face are issues with that, that stem from global economic conditions and are not actually the issues associated with individual people who are you know, in close proximity with wildlife and making decisions about their own life um, in a very specific context. Instead, we're talking about large corporations and industries, policies um, that have far reaching impacts uh, and, and not what's actually happening um, day to day, for example, along the boundary of, of a national park in Uganda. So I think that it's important that we think about the change that's needed and I think also it's necessary to realize that that change is possible. Too often, I think that people feel as though this is too big of an issue. It's not possible to handle it or to deal with it. Um, and I think if anything, we now are at a point where we have no other option. The way that we have set up our interactions with the natural world are so toxic that um, we're in a grave situation, you know, as, Annika said, this is bad. And, um, and it's, hard, it's, it's hard to even belabor the point because it is so bad, it seems so obvious. Um, but we also, if anything, this past year have learned that it is possible to quickly pivot and uh, change policies and come up with new ways of doing things. So I think that change is both needed and actually possible. You know, it's not that it will necessarily be easy, um, but it is possible. So we have to change policies. We need to change consumer culture and also our expectations of corporations and industries um, and, and, and maybe even expectations of what we have in our own lives. You know, the coltan situation, it's exactly right. Um, coltan is, is a great example of something that we can't live without. We certainly can't live without it at this point. Um, perhaps we could, uh, you know, support synthetically derived coltan to be made and, and used instead, which by the way would mean you couldn't get electronics as cheaply as you do now. That's the sort of mind reframing that might have to happen um, ultimately, but also I think simply the fact that if you can afford a new electronic device every year, you could think about the fact that maybe you don't need one every year and we could change, you know, right now we have a culture in which it's like considered very positive if you're always the first person in line to get the new iPhone or um, you have the coolest new technology and maybe that's not actually something you need. Um, and we also have to change how we calculate the costs and benefits of these things. We have to start including the actual costs of the effect we are having on the earth as we try and understand uh, what policies we should have and how different corporations and industries should be treated. So ultimately, I think uh, both what I've, what I've presented and what Annika mentioned suggests that we need a reframing, right? And, and I completely agree that I think part of that reframing is actually listening to other people um, and not assuming that we know what is right. And I also think that it is worth critiquing capitalism and the, the, the unwritten or unwritten rules that we have laid out um, in terms of how capitalism works and this idea of profit over everything else. Again, if you calculate into profit um, the actual costs of what we're doing to the environment, then that might change the, the reality of capitalism. So I think we need to challenge the concept that it, it's either nature or profit um, and realize that destroying nature 
is leading to lost profit. And there actually uh, is a quote from the from um, this person who was part of Patagonia, who says uh, there is no business on a dead planet. And I think, you know, for people who are so focused on profit incentives and on business and on free markets and on not allowing anything to impede with that, um, I think that we have to also realize that we are driving our, our planet to die and there isn't profit, uh, there's no business on a dead planet. When I was looking for that quote, I thought it interesting that I came across this article from The Atlantic um, from 2016 that said, human extinction isn't that unlikely. And then the very first line of this says, nuclear war, climate change, pandemics that kill tens of millions. I mean, four, five years ago now at this point, five years ago almost to the day, uh, you, you have people talking about how we're interacting with, with the environment. I mean, this, the headline here says a typical person is more than five times as likely to die in an extinction event as in a car crash. So for we've known about this, this negative relationship for a long time. And the question is, what is ever going to make us change um, how we're thinking about these things? what we find important. And a lot of people have asked, I mean, many of you have asked, what, what have we learned from the past year? Is this what we needed to fix all of it, right? Is it all gonna be better now? Because now we all know how important it is to care about the natural world. And I'm sorry to tell you that no, it's not. Um, in fact, we know that already getting back to usual has meant that people are, back to pre-pandemic um, emission rates. Uh, so this is an article in Forbes from the beginning of March of this year that says global carbon emissions bounce back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, more recently, just uh, six days ago, this article from the Washington Post says carbon emissions on track to surge as world rebounds from the pandemic. Um, I, I think, you know, part of why I, that, that lecture on memory that we had last time was so important to me is that I think we do really risk moving on from this and forgetting anything that we learned. And there are so many important messages that were highlighted by this pandemic about ways that we need to change the things that we're doing. Um, and this interaction with the natural world is only one of them. Um, and unfortunately, I, I don't think that even this massive disruption to our lives has been the lesson that we need. I don't, I don't know what, what will ever um, impact people to really make a change, but unfortunately it appears this has not been it. Um, so with that, we actually have plenty of time, over 20 minutes for questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and Annika and I are gonna have a conversation about some of your questions. I see that there are a lot in here. Um, so Annika, I wanna start with a clarifying question for you. Um, oh, let me find it in here. I, mar I marked where it was, but now I have to actually find it. Okay, so uh, there was a clarifying question about what exactly is a praxis and what is meant by being human is a praxis in relation to the fact that humans exist as a broad spectrum of groups of people. Um, the, the question continues, but hopefully, is that enough? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was scrolling through the questions while you were speaking and I saw that one too. Um, so praxis um, is a word that is used in some political philosophy um, to combine the concepts of theory and practice in order to emphasize that they're actually the same thing. Um, and that everything that we do that you know might be called practice in some sense is also enacting a theory. All of our actions are informed by ideas or theories that we have about the world. Um, so when we say praxis, we mean both, you know, a thing that is enacted, an action that has effects in the world, um, that is informed by and produces ideas about the world. And when Sylvia Winter says being human is a praxis, um, what she means is that the boundaries of the category of the human are always made and remade and made differently in the ways that we're interacting with each other and in the structures that shape how we and how different um, kinds of people are able to interact with each other. 
Excellent. Thank you. So you mentioned you were looking through the questions. Is there, I, I have a whole list, but if there's some that stand out to you. Um, oh man, there've been a lot since the last time I looked. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you want to start? <laughs> Um, okay, so I'll, I'll ask one. So several people, um, let's see, is this what I want to start with? Yeah, okay, so I actually wanted to start with the, the last point that I was making because several people had asked about that even leading up to me making that point um, in terms of like, will actually change people's behavior. So I kind of gave my thoughts on that. What are your thoughts on you know, I know, I know, well, I, I'll let you answer. Yeah, what are your thoughts? <laughs> what will actually change people's behaviors? Um, I mean, I think this is, again, one of those cases where we should pay a lot of attention to the categories that are being used. What will change whose behaviors? Um, and whose behaviors are, are having what kinds of impacts here? Because I think it is it is just as important not to oversimplify that kind of question as it is not to oversimplify a concept like the Anthropocene or, or the anthro in Anthropocene. Yeah, that's a great point. So let's go with like um, middle class white Americans and uh, let's do that as one category and then another category is like agribusinesses in the United States. Um, what will change the behaviors of middle class white Americans? Uh, what that I knew, I think if everybody had a good answer to that question, we would not be in this situation. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that it is very, very easy for these kinds of um, very big and important perhaps too big and important to see in kind of our everyday lives of like going to school and going to work and like putting food on the table and paying the bills and like taking care of the kids and the pets and all that stuff. Like it's really easy to lose sight of the planet as, as an analytic or as like a thing that is looming large in your reality. Um, and I think a lot of inaction is not um, denial or maliciousness or ignorance or um, kind of lack of care is just exhaustion. I mean, I think like the middle class is shrinking rapidly, you know, like the tons of people, like what, like 40% of Americans live like at or below the poverty line, like vast majority of people have more than one job. Um, we're talking about a bunch of like a sort of vanishing category when we talk about the white middle class that like has it good and has the house in the suburbs and has like the one single nine to five job with benefits. And like increasingly when we're talking about like people who are supposed to be engaging in political action, we're talking about like an exhausted, terrified, like rundown in debt, medically deprived group of people. Um, such that like the, e the easier it is structurally to make the good choice, the more it will happen. And so I think it is a lot more efficient and effective to kind of concentrate on making the choices available, um, easily available, readily accessible than it is to like guilting people into rearranging their whole lives to buy more organic produce. Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I agree so much. That's why, you know, I, one of the things I always have at the top of my list when I talk to people about what they can do to help with issues in the environment is vote, because I think that actually policy changes are at our core here, right? I mean, just like I was talking about in terms of what the actual costs are, um, we're, we're so far from, yeah, getting to deal with that. So, I mean, in terms of like the agro business or let's say, you know, people who are actually in charge of making decisions for corporations, let's say, how do we get them to change? Um, nationalize them, dismantle them, like, dismantle the profit motive. I, I don't think they will actually, um, unless they are destroyed, basically. Um, I, unless unless they are forced, I guess. <laughs> say that, let's say well, it we like can, that. We can, we can individually decide how militant we're willing to be. That was a little bit of 60 there. Um, but you know, I mean, I think when we, when we look at, for example, fossil fuel industries, um, there is just overwhelming evidence that they have known that what they are doing is, is 
damaging the planet and changing the climate for like 40 years at this point, at least. And they are also, they're preparing for those eventualities. So what they're gonna, you know, they're planning to do is like get almost to the tipping point of destroying the earth and then force people to rely on the, the like techno solutions that they are engineering. You know, like how many times have you seen banner ads from like ExxonMobil and Shell about carbon capture? Oh yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, I think several of the students were asking questions about corporations trying to shift the onus onto individuals. And I think that, that there's been some great work on, on that. Um, you know, in, in particular, I, the oil industry has been great about like showing how green they are, you know, by I mean, I personally have worked with, uh, had jobs in biodiversity where I was being funded by oil companies because they, you know, wanted to do a biodiversity assessment in a place where they were putting in an oil pipeline and things like that. Um, so they they have these, outwardly, they have this, this face of like, oh no, we're really trying our best. Meanwhile, you know, exactly as you're describing. And I think that they are a lot of a lot of the work that's been done is to try and shift the blame onto the consumer. Um, and while I think you know, I think that people do. I, I know that you may argue with me about this, but I do think that people have a lot of power to um, you know make choices that uh, at their individual level are not going to completely change the world. But if everybody made those choices, everybody who had the ability to make those choices made those choices. Um, we would certainly see some shifts, even in terms of this consumer demand kind of situation that we live within in the United States, um, to have at, to to push to push things a little bit in the right direction um, and getting those kind of bigger policy changes and also uh, corporate changes. You're nodding your head. Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, I I don't. I definitely don't disagree with that in in the hypothetical. Um, I just think it's, it is like almost impossibly difficult to make that happen. Um, like how many times have you tried to like start a new habit, you know? Like I've tried to teach myself how to run so many times and like, it's good for me. Objectively, I should do it. Like do some cardio, it's whatever, heart health. But I, I'm terrible at it. Um, I will, oh, let's go ahead. <laughs> and I just, I mean, I think the kind of amount of the, the amount of like labor and f I, I, don't, I don't even know how you would organize something like this, but like to what it would take to convince every individual who was able to make X choice to make X choice and do it consistently is like actually a lot less than, than what it might take to just change the structure that makes those choices require that kind of effort in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I will say I'm a terrible person to ask how many times have you tried to change a habit because I am like for my whole life, people have said to me like, oh my gosh, it's insane how much you like live what you believe. Like I'm, I'm obnoxious in the fact that once I learn that something is wrong, I like, you know, work very hard as quickly as I can to make changes to address that. And then just like buy it fiercely in a way that I will say is totally exhausting. Um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, I think in general, that's, and, and you know, it, it certainly depends on the time in my life and d what I've had access to and those sorts of things that hugely impacts my ability to do that, right? So um, it's hard for sure. And yeah, whether it's harder to get everyone to do that than to actually change the structure is a, is a good question. I wanna shift slightly. Um, there was a question that says, can you give any modern examples of how language may be used to include and exclude within the Anthropocene? Does this reflect how we currently use language in political or legal statements? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that excerpt from the blog post in my slideshow was sort of intended to do that, um, to show some of these ways that language kind of subtly constructs an in-group and an out-group um, and an us and a them. So I'm trying to think off the top of my head if there's like another one that I can pull out quickly. Uh, if you look at a lot of the stuff on um, human rights violations or just the discourse on human rights in general, which is 
um, disproportionately applied these days to countries where people are largely of a different color than Geneva, the people who are, you know, running the show. Um, it is generally not applied to um, things that happen in the US and Western Europe. For example, um, the solitary confinement of prisoners in the US, um, which is a human rights abuse according to the definitions, but it never gets called that. Um, similar, I mean, the way that we talk about uh, police violence and police shootings. Um, there's this great app, maybe I should pull it up, that tracks um, live update changes in New York Times um, headlines. And it's really interesting to watch the initial headline go from like officer kills unarmed black man to like civilian dies following, like just to watch the shift to this like really passive language that like takes all of the agency out of the person who shot the gun and committed the murder and, and makes it seem as though it just was like a natural event that happened. Um, that kind of thing is like a really good example of how, how language is always being used and manipulated to kind of construct responsibility and ethical subjecthood in different ways. Absolutely. Um, there's a, there are several comments also about like just appreciating this idea of equity and uh, it, recognizing where we're putting the onus, those sorts of things. Um, and then some questions about kind of any recommendations for what would have an impact. Do you have any thoughts on like, for example, one of them is what policy if implemented would have the most immediate impact? Um, what are ethical business models, those sorts of questions? Um, I guess, I mean, I should like qualify this with, I'm, I'm not really a policy person. It's not my area of expertise um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so I cannot, I don't think, I mean, I, I could speculate, but it would just be speculation. Like I, I have no like tested or gamified like answers to that. Um, ethical business. I don't know that there is such a thing as ethical business. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, some students are also saying that they've taken a lot of classes in the business school and that these mm -hmm. never get talked about there. So, I mean, it doesn't <laughs> like this is capitalist realism, right? Like the fact that we're trying to think about solutions in terms of business practices, that's capitalist realism. Like, let's think outside of business. Yeah, you know, like, how else could we organize society and production and the meeting of needs? Let's you know, talk why about are we that actually. This all to businesses. <laughs> yeah, no, let's talk about that actually because that's what students are asking. Like, okay, so this seems like highly critical of capitalism. So what, or, or business in general? You know, there's a lot, lot of different comments in that vein. So, so what is the suggestion as an alternative, and that's realistic? I almost don't even want to engage with the realism question. Okay, I feel like like putting the caveat of you know realistic according to who, right? Um, and in what ways is the the like specter of unrealism being used to shut down the kinds of imaginative exercises that would allow us to think about how we might differently organize production and meet needs as a society? You know, yeah, I, I think I, we actually we need to do a lot of that imagining. You know, like we I, need to I, allow ourselves to kind of like spin out kind of wild possibilities out far, far outside of the way that things are currently being done. And like, will all of them work perfectly? No, of course not. Um, but we can't shut it down before it begins. That's why we're stuck here. Absolutely. <laughs> I think, you know, there are actually two great examples related to that. Um, one is that prior to pandemic, so many people who, uh, you know, were dealing with disability were asking for better access and alternative ways of working and things like that. And just re over and over again, we're told, no, it's not possible. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's not realistic. Right. And then the pandemic hits and all of a sudden everybody can do re remote work. You can literally everything that you could do in person almost could be done remotely. Um, and, and, you know, it just, I think it was really upsetting to a lot of people who have needed that option mm -hmm. this whole time and told like, no, there's just no way that it can happen. And it's like, no. And I mean, that's kind of 
Also, why I was mentioning this, if this year has shown us anything, it's the fact that uh, things are possible, that we claim are not possible, they are possible, so we should be doing this. And I love the idea of that, you know, don't be constrained by anything, actually just start thinking of all these potential solutions. And it also reminds me of, um, you know, the, the recent meeting to, to try and figure out the Paris Accord and, and how we're going to approach um, these environmental issues in the future. I heard a story about that and how they said that half of the technology technology that is needed to actually reduce our emissions as we have promised to do has not been invented yet. So these things that we will be inventing in the time that we're working towards reducing emissions, right? And like, I mean, I actually love that because it's like, right, let's not be, let's not be held back by what exists right now. Obviously, People, however defined, are very uh, creative and have come up with solutions to things for a long time. And so if this is what we have decided is important, then I think we can actually come up to solu for, with solutions to it. I think that so often that, that framing of like, no, but it's not possible because what we have to be concerned about is profit and progress and those sorts of things. Um, I think that that framing has limited us this whole time. If what we decide is like, no, actually, we need to be addressing these issues, and we are going to address these issues, then the solutions are, are possible simply by the fact that people will make it happen. Um, were there other questions that you saw? I have some additional ones, if you haven't. I, I'll also say, as you're looking at the questions, uh, mm -hmm. I'm very encouraged by the fact that there are some um, lawsuits happening of the of youth, uh, generally defined, um, suing the government because of the state of the environment and the fact that you know their future, including like aspects of health and security and things like that, are in jeopardy because we have not been dealing with climate change issues this whole time. Um, and you know that that I think is such a shift from what older generations, the way older generations have approached this. And so that definitely gives me some encouragement that hopefully we will, you know, as people just have been brought up acknowledging their whole lives, we have been in an uh, environmental crisis. I think that hopefully will help us to, um, I don't know, change the approach as as all of you who are in the audience become the leaders in the future. Do you have another question there, Annika? Um, let's see, I am scrolling. I am seeing a lot of stuff about business practices and different forms of policy, um, including at WashU. A lot of people are kind of curious about if and whether WashU um, has tried to do anything to reduce its environmental impact or address any of the environmental problems in the area. Do you know anything about that? Or perhaps you could speak to that? I actually don't know as much about that as I should. Um, and so that's something that I could try and get some information for for our last lecture. Uh, I believe that there are a lot of concerns. Um, and I'll recommend Brett Gustafson is a faculty member in anthropology. And I think he's been very outspoken on particularly issues of WashU's inv involvement with some um, energy producing sources. Again, I don't have enough details to, I feel like answer this question appropriately, uh, but definitely within the department, I think we have some experts who, who speak to these concerns um, and are outspoken about them. Do you have any additional information? Um, I am I am not 100% sure what the situation about this is with WashU, but I do know WashU has a very large endowment and many university endowments um, are invested in um, stock portfolios essentially that profit from fossil fuel industries like university endowments are invested in fossil fuel industries. And so I know there have been a number of student movements um, of different universities across the country to pressure universities to divest their endowments um, from industries that profit from fossil fuels. Um, so I don't know if that's already happening here, um, but for folks who are in St. Louis on campus and looking for something to do, that could be a great place to start. 
Yes, and we already have multiple comments. She was not divested from fossil fuels. There's a student group that protests about it. Another one that says, I was just about to recommend Professor Gustafson's course, um, Global Energy and the American Dream was super enlightening for me. And he does discuss washing in regards to climate change and fossil fuels. So definitely some uh, helpful comments. Thank you to those of you who submitted those. Um, and be sure to check that out. I mean, I think we have a great wealth of resources. Mm -hmm. can go even beyond what we've talked about in this class. Um, so I wanna also ask you, uh, there's this <laughs> question that was submitted and I feel like we, every lecture I get a question kind of like this. Um, with the advent of mRNA vaccines and constant improvement in biotechnology, why should humans be concerned about the increased transmission of pathogens? And I'm always having, you know, all of the topics that we've discussed in this course, I'm always a little sad when I see questions like that because uh, we've covered how many people have died, how many people's lives have been really horribly uh, impacted, how many people have lost loved ones. Um, and despite the fact that we have a vaccine in record time, right? So uh, I think the, the losses are, are an answer to that question alone, um, but I'm just wondering if you have other thoughts or responses to that. Um, yeah, I have several thoughts about that. Um, one of them, you know, as you've already brought up is that how many hundreds of thousands of people globally have already died before we had this like magical vaccine techno fix roll out. Um, how many countries still don't have any of the vaccines and you know are projected to not have them until late this year or next year or the year after? Um, like, are you cool with brown people dying? Like, is, is that the implication there? I don't know. And then, you know, I think the other thing is that like relying on these kind of techno fixes, um, like, the problem will happen and then we'll just invent a solution for it afterwards. It's really risky. It's a huge gamble. You know, it like kind of worked this time. I don't know if you want to call several million dead people worked, uh, but I guess it did happen eventually, but that doesn't mean it will happen the next time. It doesn't mean it will continue to happen in the future, like when similar problems arise. Um, it, is, it is a really dangerous thing, I think, to gamble and to bet on. Um, and that doesn't take into account all of the effects on, you know, non-human animals and ecosystems as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I think, you know, that's uh, so many people, it seems like want a quick fix to this, like, well, uh, the, it doesn't seem, it seems like we have a solution now. So like, we don't actually need to worry about that. Right. Like this thing, mm -hmm warning about for decades that we need to be worried about pandemics because of how we're interacting with the environment like probably let me brush that off we don't need to worry about it or uh okay how about we just like kill off wildlife i mean i we have questions about like so wait if we just killed off other species then they wouldn't be able to harbor pathogens and we wouldn't have to worry about getting them from them um and there were a lot of questions like that earlier on about bats uh which that's not how that works. And also that's not a solution. Further interfering with natural cycles is not a solution. Um, and I also think, you know, the, the issue is that as we further interfere with the environment, it's not just about the pathogens that we're encountering. It's also the fact that we're setting up other health issues that then make us more susceptible to those pathogens, right? So we already know air quality has led to some long-term health complications in people who then had worse outcomes with COVID. Uh, we introduce all of these toxins into the environment that are getting into our bodies. And so our ability to deal with novel pathogens as they come out is, is impacted further by the other ways in which we're impacting nature, which ultimately leads back into impacting our health. So I think recognizing that connection, you know, we've talked about the One Health approach in here and that connection between the environment, other animals and humans is so important and acknowledging that this, this is a big deal and that it's not, there is no easy fix to the problems that we're dealing with here. So I think with that, we are all out of time. Is there any last message that you want to say to everyone? Well, I think that about covers it. Yeah. Vote if you want to, I guess. Destroy capitalism in the meantime. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, great. Well, with that, I will say, you know, I, um, uh, I hope at least that we've given everyone things to think about. Uh, our next session are discussion groups, and then we will have our last lecture in a week. Until then, stay safe.